You thought the faction wars were done, huh? Wrong. This one might have been even better. So in all my Kiss Love campaigns, at least the ones with the Tsarina, Scrag the Slaughterer goes ham. He gobbles up all the territory in the Southwest and absolutely bullies the Empire if you don't support them. And frankly, you've got other things to worry about with Kislev. So we figured, hey, an ogre invasion of the motherland should be fun. And by our son, was it ever. We've got a protracted artillery and gunpowder line battle to start, evolving into a tactical and micro-intensive defense with some super cool units and strategies to show off. So grab some snacks, manhandle your guts, and get ready for the Battle of Beasts, Bears, and Battlestar Galactica. Two very different army styles on the Kislev side, but they're united by one of the best units in Kislev's roster, the Light War Sleds, which are everything War Wagons wish they were. Serena Katarin has Ice Sheet, Frost Fang, Ice Shard, and Frost Blades, but is lacking an important spell, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Rest of the build is Zargard, Kossars, the Griffin Legion, and Ice Guard wielding Glaives, which in my opinion are much better in campaign than they are in multiplayer. They're just not super cost efficient here, but they can still put in some serious work from range and in melee when their name is called. Throw in a Snow Leopard, a bunch of Cav, and you can see Katarin wants to drag the Ogres through Slows and Frostbite while the Mobility nips at the flanks. For Kostaltin, it's the Little Grom play, and these are an extremely good artillery piece in pitched battles. They're accurate, they hurt like hell, they're tanky, and though they aren't Iron Blasters, they absolutely positively get the job done. I really like them. Light War Sleds in the Vanguard, great for bowling over infantry, highly mobile at 75 speed, typically not worth chasing with anything, because they'll just shoot you to death, and they're hard to deal with, but still have that ugly ice effect that could probably use some touching up. In the rear, it's Kostaltin, the 17th Supreme Patriarch of Total War Warhammer, and he's a bit of a freak. Incredible support for Warbear Riders, giving them charge bonus, vigor, regen, fire damage, and plus 40 melee attack with Tor's Battle Him, while being essentially unkillable and unbreakable himself. When he drops low, he automatically starts healing and he hits harder, so definitely going for some Rasputin vibes with this character, and that is a scary hit squad when Kostaltin and Bears are working together. You do not want to be a large target and anywhere near them. But across the snowy steps come the ravenous ogre tribes with a sneaky ambush planned amongst some saber tusk pack and man-eater pistols, but the real focus of the build is on artillery. These three Noblar scrap launchers are meant for wave clear and for devastating infantry, something they're quite adept at doing while being way cheaper than their iron blaster counterparts. They can thrash ice guard, czar guard, Kossars, any infantry from across the map, but they do have somewhat limited ammo. Other than that, it's a horde of Noblars and Ogre Bulls with some Lead Belchers in the rear. Very good unit, especially when you expect a gunpowder duel. Quite squishy, but they deal a lot of damage from range, so as burst damage against enemy skirmishers or bears, they come highly recommended. Leading their army is a Butcher of the Great Maw and an Ogre Tyrant with Bull Gorger, Brain Gobbler, and the Maw for Wave Clear. Both of them quite powerful combatants in their own right. And hiding in the rear are the mighty Rhinox Crushers with great weapons and more Saber Tusk pack. Leading them are a Fire Belly and another Tyrant, mostly because Grease's Skull Tooth is absolute ass in this matchup. He's a terrible pick against Kislev. We got Piercing Bolts of Burning, Flamestorm, Eruption, Tenderizer, and Fire Breath as his spells and abilities. And the Tyrant has Greedy Fist for increasing enemy cooldowns and Snacks for regen in melee. See, even he's busting out the popcorn to watch some Milk and Cookies Total War action. Add a sprinkling of Iron Guts on the flanks, and those are the builds for both sides in this faction war, and things will get started with a bang, because it's going to play out like a Napoleon-style land battle. Artillery and shooting in formation for days. Which is frankly, a fantastic change of pace from the melee rushes that characterize most factions in Warhammer 3. Nalbar Scrap Launchers are immediately dropping a deluge of iron on the Ice Guard, which is a very intelligent target to try and eliminate at the start. Their focus fire can mess up even heavily armored ogres. They'll slow you down. They're good in melee and they're expensive. So they're pretty much the ideal target for artillery. And if you can take out two or three units of ice guard before battle is joined, which might happen in an artillery duel like this one, then you're getting insane value for your 900 gold scrap launchers. But speaking of value, this is why you bring little Grom. It's great for sniping out single entities, but it might be even better for killing monstrous infantry because that cannonball will penetrate multiple models like 
I'm not gonna say it, but it's a collateral, and four or five monsters to infantry dead per shot is super nice. Metal Blur Scrap Launchers have something to say back, though. Ice Guard taken to Pound Town from across the map. And honestly, I'd say the Nobler Scrap Launchers are probably winning that trade. You're willing to trade some Ogre Iron Fist that only costs 650 gold for a bunch of dead Ice Guard. Ice Guard are 1,200. They are pretty much double the value of these Ogre Iron Fists. And there's just so much HP for Kislev to cut through here. So it'll be interesting to see what they decide to focus down and whether they can force a premature rush with their little Groms and War Sleds. It's almost exactly how the AI functions in Campaign 2. They'll sit still and trade until the moment they've had enough and have simply taken too much damage to ignore it anymore. And then they'll bum rush. And an Ogre Bull Rush here in 2v2s is scary. Now I was saying that the Zarina didn't have the best spell setup. And in my opinion, you really want Heart of Winter here for one, because she won't be able to use all her wins only spamming Ice Sheet and Frost Blades anyway. But the Ice Witch under Castleton's Wing has Heart of Winter and it's essentially a final transmutation with a slow component. So you plop it on an onrushing horde, they progressively get slower, it deals more and more damage, and then you see which side they're trying to escape to and cast an ice sheet in their path, which effectively denies that area and makes it treacherous ground. That combo can stop an onrushing horde in its tracks. It's essentially a net and it gives your ranged troops way more time to fire. So that will be the strategy here. Both sides are being torn apart in this artillery duel. Lead Belchers are the new target for Kislev, and the Lil Groms, two of them, can take a unit of Lead Belchers out quite quickly, because the way that formation's set up, each time a cannonball hits, it's probably taking out two or three models. But the Belchers themselves have taken the, the War Sleds down to about half health. Both sides moving up, trying to do some skirmishing. The Ice Guard are... they're just getting dumpstered by those Scrap Launchers, who are down to half ammo, but they can still kill a lot more models on the way. And here come the Griffin Legion, screaming down the mountainside. Noblars will do the one thing they're good at, dying. But for 200 gold, you will throw thousands of them to their deaths and smile about it. They're slaves for a reason. Their lives are meaningless. But the Ice Guard, those losses will be felt acutely for Zarina Katarin. She would like to have all three of those Ice Guard ready to go, ready to kill when the battle lines close. But at the moment, it doesn't look like the Ice Guard or the Lead Belchers will have Many of their number remaining by the time Kislev and the Ogre Kingdoms join in glorious melee combat. They're both important units. I think they've received the message. They'll retreat out of range and will take no further part until they stop being punished for their mere presence. In the meantime, Griffin Legion are taking this opportunity to purge the field of stinky Noblar trash. They're backed up by the Snow Leopard, which I find a very interesting unit. It's cheap, it's squishy, it's not meant for prolonged duels, but feels like one of those troop choices straight from the tabletop where it deploys in models of one and hunts artillery or mages or otherwise uses a bodyguard to help protect your lords or casters. Will never be a catastrophic loss when it dies, but with some good micro, it can chunk through some important targets. I like them quite a bit. Ice Guard are down to almost no HP in the back there. One of the units is completely devastated by all that Nalbar scrap launcher fire, but if you're Kislev, at least they're about to be out of ammo and now all you have to deal with is a 15 ton behemoth that will just run you over you know no big deal whatsoever and the artillery duel is still going on in earnest rhinox crushers and saber tusk pack might change that though they're looking to get aggressive here but they're a huge target and little groms lick their lips in anticipation when they see rhinox crushers show up they've already taken some damage from that cannon fire did not lose models in fact they're some of the only units in the game that can take cannonballs to the face and not lose a model. They have so much HP, but still, once they get in range, the little Groms are going to turn their attention to that incredibly expensive 1900 gold monstrous cavalry unit, and it hurts real bad. For the moment, the lead belchers are still in range somehow, being torn asunder from that long range focus fire, 450 range on the little Groms, and the ogres are definitely starting to to feel like the rush is imminent. They're massing at the borders of the realm. They want the feast to begin, just got lucky cannonball stopped by the trees there. And with the Rhinox catapult starting to run out of ammo and the lead belchers forced backwards after some cross map snipes from Kislev's cannons, it's about time for this assault to begin. Griffin Legion in the vanguard, moving up the center. Quite an even artillery duel. I'm not sure which side won it to be honest, but 
Ogres are the ones looking to close the gap here, so maybe that tells you all you need to know. Here it comes. Rhinox moving out of the trees. Ice sheets hitting the floor. Things will start getting real spicy. The ogre mobility is out in full force, and they are charging in. Ice Sheet's an underrated spell, I feel. Look at the way it's kind of denying the aggression on this side. They'll still be able to charge through, but it does slow down the assault and give those cannons and Cossars a little bit more time to fire. And that's where we should focus our attention now, because two little Groms are pounding the Crushers with great weapons in the center. And though they will be able to force back the Griffin Legion and deal quite a tremendous amount of damage to them, they're being destroyed by that withering artillery fire. And it's just Value City for the Sons of Ursun at the moment. Lil Groms are truly amazing. I, I don't know why they're so accurate. I'm kind of cool with it, I guess. But yeah, I mean, I, I guess hitting a target that large, Woolly Rhinoceros from the prehistoric age, maybe not the most difficult thing in the world. But yeah, they're uh, seriously making those monsters cavalry sad. And here comes the Firebelly and the Tyrant out on the Kislevite right flank. And a huge piercing bolts of burning destroying two units of Kossars, immediately triggering their unbreakable state, which will wear off in 30 seconds. Rhinox managed to push through, but with only slivers of HP remaining on them. And now here comes the full weight of the Ogre Assault. From all sides, they are collapsing in. And that is an epic sight to behold. Flamestorm pushing back the Zar Guard, a towering pillar of fire and death. And that will lead the Stonehorn to plunge in directly after it. Griffin Legion trying to escape through their own battle lines. But here comes the monstrous single entity freak from the Mountains of Morn. Stonehorn about to rampage through their battle lines, and this is a dream scenario for him. It's all infantry, nothing to tie him down and slow him down for the moment. The Bear Cav are tied down in other situations, with the Iron Guts closing in from the flank. Yeah, this front line for Kislev will buckle and quickly. Bunch of Iron Guts were hidden in the woods for the majority of the battle, just now making their presence known, and quickly forcing Kislev's fodder into their unbreakable state, and they'll route soon after. Low Groms are not fast. Again, they're not Iron Blasters. They don't have that 60-plus speed, so retreating to the safety of their own battle lines is more challenging for them. Even some of the War Sleds are cycle-charging through all these Noblar bodies, but the Iron Fists, the Iron Guts, and the rest of these Ogre Bulls all that mass, all that crushing weight pushing through, and tons of wavering, tons of routing in the center. Things are starting to look bad for Kislev, because their front lines are buckling quickly. And once your back line is inundated and your artillery is no longer firing, it's going to be really hard to cut through all this HP. But the Heart of Winter and Ice Sheet combination is kicking in, and look at how those are layered. So the unit tries to escape the Heart of Winter, then it hits the Ice Sheet, then it hits another slow, and it's barely moving at that point. It's essentially netted in place. Piercing Bolts of Burning raining down in the Kislev backline, trying to hit some bears, and the remnants of those Ice Guard who were just pounded into oblivion by those Noblar Scrap Launchers. Heart of Winter dealt some good damage to the Ogre Tyrants and the other single entities caught up in there. Stonehorn's down to half HP. Some of that due to Heart of Winter, some of that due to the Cannonball Fire coming in. A Maw opening up in the rear, forcing more Kislevite fodder into that unbreakable state and hitting the Ice Guard too. So nice casts in the back to force those range units to move and stop firing. Frostblades on the bears. They're going after the Noblar Scrap Launchers, which, I mean, they've done all they can. They've already gotten good value. Might as well run in and just provide more mass and HP on the front ranks. Tyrant and a Stonehorn engaging with Castalton and the War Bears. Will those bonus for Slarge, Halberd wielding monstrous cavalry for Kislev, manage to cut through all these large targets? They are a hard counter in many ways, but there's so many ogres pushing through, and there are not many more ranks to hold them in place. Ice Guard forced to fire from point blank range as the remnants of the Rhinox Crushers and the rest of those Iron Guts push through. Stonehorn into the Ice Guard now. They won't last for long after that one. Bears will have to shoulder a heavy burden here as the Ogre Death Ball and their crushing weight continues to shove everything in their path aside. Serena Catarin's army is in tatters. She took the brunt of the initial assault, her troops dying so that Castaltons might yet live. Still a better love story than Twilight. But well, the other important note to make here is that the Buy Our Blood passive is creating so much extra time for Kislev's forces. That 30 second unbreakable state adds up when it's two full armies making use of it. And although the Kislev army is crumbling quickly, 
most other races would have already been running. So the Motherland's faction passive is making a tremendous impact at the moment. And then when you stack that on top of the Ice Sheet spam, which is creating big areas that make it hard for the Ogres to traverse, even if it doesn't necessarily feel like that faction passive is doing tons of work here, it really is, and it's relieving some of the pressure on Kostaltin and the Bears. But still, they have a lot of work to do. The Ogres would honestly be better off here if they would spread out a little bit more and stop the Blobs, because it's making it very easy for the Heart of Winter and the Ice Sheet stacking to hit them. And that's like the, that's half their army is slowed down right now and taking a ton of overcast final transmutation damage. Stonehorn got overzealous and pushed too far forward. Ice Shard from Zarina Katarin, smacking it in the ass and the Polar Bear is chasing after him and Stonehorn is dead. That is a big loss for the Ogres. That Heart of Winter was exquisite. Just got so much value from the caster there. Remember, it doesn't deal quite as much damage as Final Transmutation, but it has that extra slow component. So still quite impactful against much infantry blobs like that one. And the bears are looking somewhat healthy at the moment. They can be supported by Solyak's Lullaby for healing. And of course the charge bonus and Tor's battle him melee attack buffs into the flank of the Ogre Iron Fists. Lil Grom still trying to fire from point blank range and one of them survived. That's another thing with artillery in game three. So many pieces of artillery in game one and game two have zero melee qualifications. But here we've got Lil Groms and Iron Blasters that can survive. A ton of ogres slicing them up and it's still alive and still able to fire in, although escaping might be challenging. The bears are committing to make sure it has a little bit more space and can fire one or two more times. But it's almost out of ammo anyway. Another ice sheet, making it a nightmare for these ogres to advance. And the man-eater pistols who sprang their ambush out on the flank, well, they've just been isolated and they will be cut down by the war bear riders. Man-eater pistols have great stats, but they have zero hope of beating war bear riders in mono e mono combat. And in fact, their cutlasses and their pistols will fall silent almost immediately after a war bear rider charge. Stats only go so far when you got to deal with all that armor piercing and bonus first large. Monstrous cavalry out on the flank running down all these infantry. Exactly what you want to see from your war bear riders and that's a ton of value right there because man-eater pistols are expensive. If I remember correctly they're 1400 gold so yeah or maybe 1200. Either way painful loss. Another piercing bolts of burning raining down. War Bear Riders, supported by the Frost Blades from Katarin and the Ice Witch. Man-Eater Pistols disappearing under the weight of that charge, and the entire unit is gone only a few seconds after melee is joined there. Now, the War Bear Riders, they're doing what they can to hold back the Tide, Castalton as well, but they're pretty much holding back the entire Ogre Army by themselves. It's quite literally Katarin, War Bear that have no HP left, and Castalton fighting a huge section of Ogres, but so many of those units are starting to break off too. Huge sections of the Ogre army beginning to route towards the edges of the map. Snow Leopard coming in for the rear charge and those ice sleds might be better served just charging into melee with the lead belchers. Some army abilities hitting the Ogre bulls and iron guts in the center. Another ice sheet. That has been such a spammable and effective spell this game. Just hampering the ogre's mobility, and preventing them from diving into the rear. Here come the war bear riders and the ice sleds to tie down the remnants of those lead belchers who were exploded by little groms in the early game and now left for dead in the late game. Balance of power is still dead even though we're 13 minutes in and this has been an absolutely insane battle. Scrap launcher, too cold, wants no part of it. Ice queen Katarin hitting the tyrant with magic missile that did almost nothing there that was kind of <laughs> kind of weird looking and the ice witch in the rear well she's still waiting to cast more ice sheets if she has the wins to match to do it i'm not sure what happened here what what caused all those cosars to die a fire breath from the fire belly and a full surround off on warbear riders and castalton look at how tanky he is he is literally face tanked an entire section of the ogre army for minutes at a time buying the little grom and the war sleds the space they need to shoot in and cause carnage and both little groms are well over 2000 damage value at this point in the battle more routing more ice sheets more prevention 
of their speed. And remember, ogres are fast. I think a lot of their infantry are 54 speed plus. Warbear riders with the flank charge. And it, what looked so disastrous for Kislev for large sections of that battle, they've crawled their way back into it and they might even have a small advantage at this point. In fact, it might even have a... So it might be growing into a decent advantage at this point. Bothmar is starting to swing in their favor and the Ogres have completely run out of steam. What are they supposed to use to carry the game at this point? They have a handful of Lead Belchers and Noblers left. They still have an Ogre Tyrant who can cause some carnage in melee. Both Ogre Tyrants are actually relatively healthy, but they've got to deal with Warbear Riders and Kostaltin, and they have no support now. Most of the monstrous infantry has moved towards the edges of the map and will not be returning. They're shattered. Those Warbear Riders with Stand Your Ground popped on them, and Kostaltin with his regen. He's got 73 melee attack, 69 melee defense, more than 500 weapon strength, and he can cycle charge while he regents. Tyrant dropping low. Little Grom swarmed by Iron Guts, and their armor piercing will prove too much. Does not have the speed to escape. The bears will try to, but only 20 HP. One more attack should do it. Yes, indeed. The 360 no scope from the Iron Gut, and the Little Grom is dead, but the balance of power is swinging wildly in favor of the motherland and though they have nothing left it's a pyrrhic victory it's a victory nonetheless and both their legendary lords will survive a final charge with daz's winter what i don't even remember what it's called <laughs> winter's song of winter sunlight the vigor reduction charging into the iron guts 1400 health on them and watch that plummet as they deal with all this bonus for slarge from the snow leopard and the war bear riders Amazing game. So much fun in that one. A really cool tactic from the Kislevite players to essentially slow down the assault and give their war sleds and little groms more time to fire in. And it worked. Ogres might have blobbed up a little bit too much, but you, you do want that mass. You do want to keep them together so you can support them better with your tyrants and use them like a wrecking ball. And that is how you get a lot out of monstrous infantry, but it's hard to strike that balance between getting too grouped up so you get hit by the Hearts of Winter and too spread out, which makes it easier to be fall prey to the Warbear Riders and some of those more mobile units for Kislev. 62 and 65 kills, 2,500 damage value on both little Groms, 2,000 da 2,500 damage value on both Warbear Riders, more than 2,000 on the Ice Witch and 121 kills from her Hearts of Winter and the Ice Sheet Slow was... So incredibly impactful all game long. Kostaltin was a freaking monster in the center too. Not tons of value there, but I mean, certainly not bad at 1800. Just allowing more time for the rest of those Kislev units to fire was more than enough to make him worth his cost. And the scrap launchers were amazing for the Ogre Kingdoms. They pretty much single-handedly took the Ice Guard out of the game completely. The Crushers were not great. They got focused fire by the little Groms the second they were seen, whenever they were anywhere on the field and in range of the little groms they were getting shot at. So they didn't really have much opportunity to make an impact. And that is one of the issues with incredibly expensive monstrous cav, They're just a target for anything that can shoot at them from across the map. And there's some really accurate artillery in game three as well. Iron Guts were not that great. Uh, they did their best though. I don't think they're a terrible unit, but Kiss Lev was just able to kite them and Focus fire them down, slow them with the ice sheets. Ice guard were terrible, but they got blown up by the scrap launchers, so not really their fault. They probably should have just retreated a little bit earlier, because yeah, the scrap launchers are just brutal to infantry. But really fun faction war between Kislev and the Ogre Kingdoms. I think it showed off pretty much all you would expect from both races and some cool tactics on both sides. So hope y'all enjoyed it, and I'll see you all in the next one. Indie Pride, signing out for now. Have a good one, guys.